Hey, am I the voice? Oh. I love her. And, and you know, it's funny is whenever people listen to the recording, they don't hear it. It's just you and I hear her. So people think I'm hearing voices. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're right, technically. Yeah, well, I am hearing voices. You're hearing voices. Okay, everybody out there in Facebook land, join up now. Rob Palmer is first to say hello. <laughs> That can't be the Rob Palmer, is it? Yeah, the well-known skeptic. skeptic. Oh, all right. Yeah, he was up until three in the morning last night after our trivia game. We just sat and talked with a bunch of people, and uh, he woke. I woke up this morning, and he was already texting me about something. He said, "How could you be awake?" <laughs> Nine thirty. I'm waking up here in California. Anyway, and uh, Ron Lee, I've seen, has joined the group. So over here on my right hand side, I do have a big screen. So if people see me looking off to the side a lot. I'm not ignoring Kyle. I'm looking at the, the chat, and I'm looking at what's going on over here. I'm playing solitaire. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so anyway, everybody out there, hello. Oh, and Deborah said hello. Oh, hey, Deborah. Um, hello, everyone out there in Facebook. This is uh, About Time Presents in conversation with Kyle Polish. And I am going to have a nice conversation with him today. It's, so we're doing these talks. They're a little bit different than a lecture. I mean, if somebody wants to give a lecture with screenshots and so on, like Adrian did and Rob Palmer had done, it's, it's fine. I love doing that. But I want to also have a conversation with them because this is my chance to catch up with you guys. And I really love talking to everybody and hopefully asking questions that aren't something that you would normally hear from them. I mean, we all know about the normal, you know, uh, if we want to know what's going on in somebody's life, we can look at their Facebook feed. But I want to kind of ask some different kind of questions. So it's fun. So Kyle, give everybody a couple minutes of your who are you and what are you doing wearing a big sweater like that? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm up in Big Bear for the holiday. Uh, we just, my wife and I and our parrot wanted to get away. And uh, so we picked Big Bear because it's not too far from L.A. And, you know, we can get out here and do some uh, fun stuff like kayaking and hiking and whatnot. Uh, just for a couple days. So did the did the did the bird say I'd like to go to Big Bear? Um, not explicitly. She does speak, uh, but doesn't have exactly those words. Because mm, you said uh, you and your wife and the bird wanted to get away. So that's right. Well, she's uh seems to be happy to be here. I'm looking at her. Maybe she'll fly over to me in a little bit. But uh, we have a, a lilac crowned Amazon who's very much a family member for us. What's her name? Uh, Yoshi. Yoshi, that's right. Hello, Yoshi. We all say hello to you. Maybe you'll come and join us a little bit. <laughs> she's green and technically a dinosaur, so. Oh, and she would blend into the background you have right now. Oh, very much so, yeah. It, it's funny. We have some pictures where it's, it's like a harder version of Where's Waldo. A bird in a tree is hard to spot, or a bird of her species. <laughs> well, with your wallpaper right now, I'm sure she would be very difficult to spot. <laughs> yeah. She's funny. So have you seen any big bears up there? I have not. I've seen no big bears, no cryptids, no nothing uh, in that oh, regard. Man. You might see a Bigfoot if you keep your, keep your camera ready because we're waiting for some good photos. Yeah, I've been waiting a little while to have something since the PG film, but uh, one of these days, right? <laughs> one of these days, somebody's going to get something. So tell everybody a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So um, I'm, if anybody knows me, they probably know me for Data Skeptic, which is my podcast. It's a show um, aimed at kind of a technical audience, but we cover things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and stuff like that, and hopefully become kind of a bridge between that very technical academic world and people who have at least sort of an armchair interest in these sorts of topics. So if you could read like a Sean, Sean Carroll book on the physics side, hopefully you can enjoy what we do. And uh, we try and cover a lot of these issues that are becoming uh, more and more relevant, just broadly culturally, but also intersecting quite a bit, I think, with the skeptical community. Mm -hmm. So we have had to, uh, uh, Kyle lives in LA area and I live up in the Monterey Bay area, which I know it's all California to anybody who hasn't really been out here. It seems like it's just, you know, nearby, but it's about a six hour drive, um, uh, to get from one place to the other. And, uh, I co co run, uh, Monterey County skeptics, which is a, um, I think we've had six different Skeptic camps oh, yeah. every January. We usually the first Saturday or the second Saturday of the year. Weather up here is really great for January. So um, we have a little skeptic camp, which is a whole day of celebration of lectures, 20, 30 minutes long, usually by people who are within the community here in Monterey. But we have people who come in from other places. And Kyle, I think, has come to all of them. And you've lectured, I think, at almost all of them. Is that right? 
pretty close. I missed one when we were in Europe, and then uh, I didn't speak at one, just part, just came. But uh, yeah, I've had the opportunity to come and do a couple of presentations over the years. It's a lot of it's fun. a great we, event, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's just um, kind of a let's get together and trying to encourage people within the community to to probably put together something. We not maybe a lot of in a lot of cases people's first talks. Um, I know sure. we had Paula Lauterbach. She did a talk on. Um, uh, what is it in Hollywood where they were saying that all the pictures, it was a conspiracy theory where the pictures were saying that the people were, were men, were actually women, oh, and right. the women were actually men, and they could, they yeah. would take a picture and they'd analyze it and they would say, oh no, that's an Adam's apple or somebody's hand is, a, fingers are too long, so it's actually a man, not a woman, and that explains the great voice range. It was, right. what? <laughs> it was wild, but you know, the best conspiracy theories always are. Yeah, and you're going to be telling us a little bit about one here in a couple minutes. Um, so I put up in the show notes, and I'll put this also on the YouTube video, that I have a lot of different lectures that Kyle has given in the past. He's spoken at uh, many different places in California talking about oh, all kinds of different things, machine learning a lot of the time. But there was one time you gave a talk in, in Monterey County Skeptics, and it's available on our YouTube channel on... Um, a conspiracy called Missing 911. And it's interesting that you're in a state park or you're in a park right now, one of these national parks or a state park. I'm close to one, yeah. Uh, or a state park, San Bernardino State you Park, might yeah. find some people missing or something. But. Yeah, there's a real concern there, right? <laughs> we had, so Kyle came to do the talk for Modern County Skeptics. It's, oh my gosh, five years ago now. I, I think mean, it's been a while, yeah. Yeah, and I said, what are you going to talk about? And he says, oh, Missing 411. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. What the heck is that? <laughs> and so he gave a talk and it was really interesting. Um, he in turn then wrote a wiki, uh, uh, article about it in Skeptical, Skeptical Inquirer, Inquirer yeah. magazine. And that allowed us, Rob Palmer, I believe is the one who did it. He went and took the article you wrote and then the, the video of your lecture. And we were able to update the Wikipedia page for the person who supports this missing 911, which you'll talk about in a moment. And we put that uh, up on his on the Wikipedia page, and it's our most hated video. <laughs> I think he put the uh, it's our most viewed video. I think this man put it up on his channel or someplace and mentioned it, and people come in regularly. I still get comments all the time, even though it's been a several years. Like, what's wrong with you people? This is you know this is not right, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. You've been called quite a few bad things, by the way, Kyle. Oh, for sure. Lots and lots of views, lots of people hating on us. It's been, and I'm thinking, hey, good that you're coming over and watching our channel, you know? <laughs> yeah. Sure, I don't care. So, you know, hate is, oh, well, haters right. got to hate. So tell us about Missing 411, which is one of my favorite stories. Yeah, it's a really interesting, very modern conspiracy that, you know, I've been able to watch unfold. You know, I can study JFK conspiracy theories, but it's all, it's, it's a bit of history, right? Uh, Missing 411, I've been able to kind of watch evolve in real time. So I first became aware of it when it got picked up on a lot of the conspiracy and, and just sort of general paranormal forums. Um, I listen to more of those types of podcasts than I probably should. I'm just sort of always scanning the airwaves for what's the weird stuff people are believing. Um, and came across on multiple fronts this idea that people were disappearing from national parks at an alarming rate. And it was just this big mystery. Um, which is quite compelling. That's a great pitch for a movie. Um, and I started looking at it more because there really could be something there, right? It's not implausible like that there couldn't be a serial killer operating, let's say, in national parks and uh, get away with it because that's probably not as well policed as like downtown Manhattan or, or, or wherever. Really? So, you know, yeah, there was like a, a certain like, what if, what if this is the conspiracy that turns out to be real, you know? Um, or not that, yeah, I suppose we could find other cases where conspiracies have turned out to be real or whatever, but this is the first one that's kind of weird and mysterious and came from the paranormal world. Also, the main guy who um, has been the author of the books and the proponent for it, this guy, David Polites, has a history in law enforcement. So um, not just some random person that decided during retirement to get into this sort of research and um, did a lot of work on it. And what I first went to do was just kind of verify, you know, what is it? Um, Oh, uh, Ray Hyman's uh, imperative, right? First, before you investigate something, see if there's actually a thing there. 
And I have to say, David Polites, I went through his books. He is not a liar. He, uh, everything he presents is, is factual. He makes minor errors, you know, things like he gets a date wrong, but none of the stories he catalogs are made up. Every person he says, hey, this person went missing, it's true. Um, and all 411 of the people in his first volumes and the many others that have come since, they are bona fide missing persons cases, um, except for the fact that some of them have been found. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, and then, you know, of the ones that haven't been found, we have to kind of dissect a little bit and say, well, okay, you know, what is the mysterious nature about it? Because cases where, let's say, a an elderly person who already has health issues goes off alone uh, in you know, the wilderness, that just sounds like a recipe for an unfortunate accident, not necessarily a conspiracy. Um, so I wanted to look into some of his claims, his ideas about clustering, because that's something I know how to study algorithmically. And as I went through it, what I found was really a bunch of uh, unfortunate situations, lost lives, families torn apart, people genuinely lost, but I found an overwhelming lack of any real mystery. Um, there would be this veneer of weird things, like uh, David would point out that it was strange how berries came up very often in many of these missing persons cases. That is freaky. Okay. Yeah, berries in the wilderness. Yeah. Or even one interesting fact that, um, actually, I, thanks to uh, one of the attendees of the Skeptic Camp helped me move this part of the narrative forward. He reported that many of these cases were found um, mysteriously undressed, um, which is a very perplexing thing. Why would someone in freezing cold weather who's lost start, of, any, of all things, undressing, right? What sense does that make? You've got to be cold and then they die of hypothermia. Um, but it turns out there's this interesting scientific thing called paradoxical undressing that as you start to get towards the later stages of hypothermia, like the, the points where you really need to get to a hospital now in an emergency, um, your body will start to feel a warm sensation. Uh, even to the point where you're hot and you take off your clothes, your body's sending you the wrong signals as it's failing. Um, so that you know, known scientific thing explained one of the large areas of open mystery in the whole missing 411 claims. Um, so I guess what's most interesting to me about it is how David has never put his penny down on what actually is the cause. You know, I proposed, hey, maybe there's this serial killer, which is a very uh, sad but mundane explanation. Um, but it's sort of this USB stick of conspiracies. conspiracies. <laughs> you could say, oh, they're being alien abductions. They're uh, being taken by transdimensional Bigfoot. There's a thousand ways you could plug in your own conspiracy to it. Uh, but he's done, up until most recently, tried to stay away from that and said, I'm just a reporter. I'm just commenting on these mysteries and uh, kind of left it to the paranormal world to speculate as to what the causes might be. Isn't he but, into uh, Bigfoot? Isn't that his You thing? know, that's another part of it that, that's quite interesting. So before coming up with this whole missing 411 narrative, David was quite active in the Bigfoot community. Uh, he presented at the, the BFRO conferences and talked a lot about that. Um, again, mostly in a way that I don't want to directly criticize. Well, I, I certainly don't believe in Bigfoot, and I don't think it's uh, plausible that there's such a creature alive today. Uh, people like Grover Krantz or Jeff Meldrum do study it with a, a certain scientific approach. And while I would criticize both of their works, I always saw David kind of aligning sort of in that area, that he seemed to be an outdoorsman who considered this something just to investigate. It wasn't that he was some hardcore true believer, per se. And he's tried to separate himself and said, no, no, Missing 4-1 is separate from Bigfoot. They're not necessarily the same thing. Although in his latest film, the second one, Missing 411: The Hunted, there's a whole segment of this uh, documentary all about uh, the skunk ape. So it, it seems to be drawing what? more. Uh, a skunk ape. It's a, it's a cryptid that's, um, oh, I don't know a lot of its history. Off top. We have to get I've Blake Smith on, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so someone who was already a Bigfoot researcher had taken some photos of an alleged skunk ape, and he's kind of weaving elements of this slowly into the narrative. Uh, like one of the witnesses in the most recent film reported hearing these weird otherworldly noises, and they comment on it, but don't go into it. So uh, from a purely, I, I guess, if I enjoy this as fiction, I like that they're stepping it up, right? We're getting to season two of Lost, where the mystery is evolving. But, um, yeah, it still remains to be just this sort of bundling of unfortunate circumstances into something that does not seem to have the mysterious veneer that's laid on top of it. Rob Palmer says that uh, he created his own Bigfoot organization. 
Oh, the BFRO was not good enough. He had to launch his own that's thing. That's what he said. That's what Rob said. And Deborah wants to know if they're re- if these skunk apes are related to skunks. <laughs> Which Never heard of that. Part. I'll have to look into it. No, no, it's it's some somebody on Facebook sent me a a, a rant a, a yesterday. <laughs> gosh, or a couple days ago, and she called me a skunt. And everybody has been sending me scut jokes. And they, I don't even know what it is. It's just oh, I, I'm now <laughs> guessing it derives from an etymology that might have gotten filtered, actually. It, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. So I'll have to ask Ben Radford about skunk apes. That's the first time. Sure. Wow, skunk apes. I, I got to get the t-shirt now. <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny. So you said, oh, I my favorite part of uh, the Missing 411 story is when he starts he writes like a policeman it's just like a formulaic here's just the facts ma'am you know he just writes this is what happened and he goes on and he describes things like you said that are obviously i think it's probably obvious what happened to the person where somebody in you know he'll describe their age maybe in their 70s and they go out for a walk by themselves up a hill in a hilly area with the wind it was really a a, a hilly uh rain um windy very windy day and uh you know he meant to go out for an hour and hours later he doesn't you know it's it's kind of like yeah i kind of get where he probably went it's doubt he was abducted by aliens or bigfoot or skunk apes (laughs) probably he fell off the and dehydrated and so on but the one i really like is whenever you said that you made the the correlate what he does is he makes the correlation between so this person who was missing was, was named Anna, A-N-A. Oh, right. And this other woman who was missing from kind of the same spot years later, her name is Pam, P-A-M. They both have three letters in their first name. And then he leaves it like that. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Like it's a weird, I, I think I, in my uh, Skeptical Inquirer article, equated it to being like a Batman villain, you know, that I, I'm only going to kill people of three names with A's in them. Yeah. Um, Pretty you know, funny. There like, are moments like yeah. that where I, I wonder if David isn't winking at us because it, it's so absurd that, you know, we would tie that in. Um, like I've been saying, there's the plausibility that a, a group, a clustering of missing people could have some, uh, some, some re- relationship, some reason why, be it uh, paranormal or otherwise. But then we add in all this weird stuff like the three-lettered names and, uh, you know, it seems to jeopardize the, the credibility of the case, which I always find strange. And he keeps pushing the borders too, you know, with state parks, national parks, and almost anybody who went missing. There was the woman in LA, was it LA? She disappeared in a, and they found her in a water tank. She got into an elevator, the elevator door right. closed. They got video of all this. She's, she's not all rational, apparently. Eliza Lamb, I believe is her name. And they find her in a water tank. Yeah, very and sad. And he includes her. It's like, that's not a missing person first off it's not a it's not a national or state park and (laughs) when you start having to reach beyond your you know what is it the bullseye effect where you you uh you you draw the circle around something after you've already shot at the at the fence sharpshooter's fallacy yeah sharpshooter's fallacy where you're like okay same with the, the bermuda triangle right good example if you're looking for something in the bermuda triangle then you have dimensions you have you don't look at stuff outside of that i would think yeah the real lesson to the whole thing that i hope people learn from when i cover missing 401 is the notion of selection bias that um you know if you say okay we're going to show an interest in missing persons when anyone who was missing and got found kind of gets disqualified even though david does include a lot of those cases Mm -hmm. so already you have a bias Um, of the people who are missing and never found well, then ask questions about where, uh, if they're lost in the wilderness. And I don't know real deep details on this kind of stuff. I'm not a ranger, but it wouldn't surprise me to find out that people who are lost in you know, the wilderness, the body decomposes quickly, that animals play a role in that, and they're never going to be found, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, so when that happens, it's just an open-ended mystery, like forever and ever, that could have been some alternative mysterious reason. Mm-hmm. So Rob is saying... Uh, well, Paula said that it is downtown LA, which is where the woman was found in the water tower in the hotel, which is kind of odd for a state park to associate it. And <laughs> I should let everybody know who's looking at the, com- who's reading and writing things in the comments. I can see like the last four comments and then it 
disappears. So just saying, if you want something to be my, get my attention, you might have to post it more than once because I can't see it. But he said that um, Rob was saying that uh, David has put in, uh, written two books on Bigfoot, I believe. And um, yeah. They're dreadfully expensive, unfortunately. I've only bought the missing 411 books. Uh, the Bigfoot ones I haven't gotten yet. Really? They're not like mainstream? Are they self-published? They're self-published and his shipping's a little pricey. And when you find them on the second market, they're always really expensive for some weird reason. I've been wanting to look into that, but it just, I don't know, time, right? Is he shipping them from like deep in the middle of the Yosemite or something? <laughs> um, the book I got, I saved the packaging just in case. And there were, for a while, you may recall, people were saying, you've not even read the books, mm -hmm. uh, which owning the books does not prove I've read them. Uh, maybe my lectures in which I quote specific pages would be better evidence, but I thought, let's at least <laughs> save the... Uh, the mailings and I had two, uh, the first shipment I got to my home address. And after that, I've, I've ordered the, I had a friend order the follow-ups just to make sure they got here. I didn't know if they would filter my name out or anything. Um, but they've come in sort of what appear to be home packaged, you know, self-published things, um, which is great. I mean, the more people can run their own businesses and stuff, you know, ship things out, go for it. Yeah. So you said you had an update for us. Um, well, about the movie, you know, he's put out the, the second documentary, mm -hmm. uh, Missing 411, The Hunted. Now focusing more on hunters. Put it down. I, have, uh, I haven't seen either of his movies. So what was the first one called? Uh, I think it's just Missing 411 or maybe Missing or something along those lines. I've got um, to put that on my list. I've, I've been making a list of things that sometime when I get time, which hasn't seemed to happen. I don't know why, but... <laughs> I relate. They all walk down and everything. I'll have to write it in here. Missing 411. i got to watch that. And The Hunted and the regular Missing 411. <laughs> The newer one I, I found more entertaining. Um, I mean, not, and also to be clear, there's nothing to be entertained about of stories of tragedy. It's, it's entertaining and understanding his narrative of the missing 411 and all that. The first one is a very matter of fact coverage of three missing persons cases mm -hmm. and has very little of the mystery. It's, it's very matter of fact. Here are three situations in which people dis disappeared. And um, I didn't deeply fact check those, but it wouldn't surprise me to find that everything was factual because it's just a statement of details, um, which is this interesting part of the missing 411 to me. He doesn't make a lot of claims. He just bundles together things and lets you draw mystery from them. But the newer film I like more because he starts to open up the mythology a little more um, and the coverage of cases is a little bit more in line. Like one of the guys who disappeared had, he was in his seventies, was missing an eye. Uh, and was in a swampy area. And again, we layer on the mystery from what is just sort of a, a plain face tragedy. But um, yeah, if you're going to watch one, I would say go with The Hunted, the newer one. I think I remember you saying that you thought these were great little story um, for somebody who's writing fiction or mystery. Oh, sure. They kind of start with these little things like, okay, here's the details. And then I guess they can do later, they can say based on a true story. <laughs> There's... That's the part that I think originally, before I really came to skepticism, got me a lot into paranormal stuff, is the wonderful what-if kind of scenario. And um, it's like missing 411 cases are the first five pages in a 20-page story in a lot of respects. So I think you might be onto something there. So Derek, uh, tell, uh, Derek Heineke says, no self-published stuff are small runs. Oh, he says, no, self-published stuff are small runs. They get brought up, bought up and resold. He had to pay $100 for a book on a rare car, and it is not a conspiracy. <laughs> ah, that explains oh, it. Yeah, yeah, when you're self-publishing, you know, you've got a very small amount. I know Mark Edward does a lot of books that he has many books that he self-publishes, and you got to print them, have them printed. You have to bind them up. You have to Stand ship them out. The Stand in line at the post office, as he's saying. So, yeah, it does add a little bit to the cost, I guess. So Sure, fair. It's a lot of work to do small run printing. Definitely. So anybody needs to check this out, you need to go and check out your talk on uh, Missing 411. And you can find all this at David uh, Pate. I hate saying his name because I always say it wrong. Spell it for us so that listeners, listeners can go to the Wikipedia page. It's David. Well, David, you will. Uh, give me a second to type it. I'm one of these people who can't spell unless I type. I can't spell any time. P-A-U-L-I-D-E-S. Yeah, so you can look up his Wikipedia page. You can find all these citations by following them to at, in the citation area, and you can find the article you wrote for Skeptical Inquire and uh, the video you did and more information about his Bigfoot 
world of Bigfoots, but it's it's just really right. interesting. And and it's and people who comment all the time, pretty hateful comments, like I said in the YouTube video, they they are really don't understand why we don't get it. And I think that's an interesting conversation that why can't we understand that these are missing people and that he's just grouped them in a book whereas we see it like okay you've grouped a bunch of missing people in a book some of them aren't missing some of them have been found and were found at the time that he was writing about them and and it's the conclusions sort of he's making the reasons why we're a little apprehensive is again because he's broadening it just to include more and more people in the group and also these odd things like you said that a lot of these people are missing and there's berry vine berries located nearby and when they find they were found and they found the body and then there's berries nearby in the wilderness and so th that's kind of really what it is it's the conclusion ish feeling that he's making and grouping them together he's clustering i think that's kind of what our problem is not so much yeah. just writing about people who are missing no, not at all. And I mean, he does in some ways, there's a possibility. I don't think this has happened, but maybe through this coverage, it could bring focus to a, a missing person and help that person be recovered. You know, uh, uh, that would be wonderful if David work reunited people with their families. I would be thrilled to see that happen. Um, but more often than not, I, I suspect that anyone co who's covered missing for one is not going to be found alive because there are cases of really generally speaking, people in wilderness areas um, who, you know, the minute you get a little bit away from civilization, and, and I'm kind of a city slicker, I don't fully appreciate this, but I get a little bit being up here in Big Bear, like you can die very quickly. <laughs> uh, slip down a little ravine, no cell signal, broken legs, um, you may not be found, you could, you might end up dying from starvation or exposure, not from the injury. Um, and I think, you know, the, a lot of the cases he covers, it's, it's doubtful anyone's going to be missing and found later in that regard, but they've recovered people and they still make it into the canon for some reason. Mm -hmm. And Usually it's really interesting is, as I'm watching you here on the screen, there's a shadow, and I don't know if it's your wife walking past or the could bird, <laughs> or it could be somebody outside the window. It could be something outside the window who's trying to, a shadow that's coming in that's going to get you. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I, I'm in the danger zone for missing 411. <laughs> you're, you're sitting there going, yeah, well, it's, it's very easy to die out here because it's really dangerous when I see the shadow go across the back. <laughs> Wait till you see the video. You'll know what I'm talking about. It's pretty awesome. funny. So let's talk about some other great stuff. Now, we, we talked about missing 911 and 411. Thank you. Mark, Mark is listening. Missing 411. Um, you wouldn't talk about deep fakes. And this is scary Absolutely. because you're yeah. like, how can we even trust anything anymore? I guess the technology that makes deep fakes look really, really realistic. I guess there's technology that will expose deep fakes just as easily. I hope because it's, but and hopefully people aren't influenced too much by the, in the meantime of, you know, what they're saying is really what they're saying. So explain deep fakes and what's going on with that. Sure. So I'm going to take for granted that most people at least know what that phrase is, or let's give them the real high level. It's when someone creates a video, usually uh, compositing, taking an old video and editing it in some way um, to replace some aspect of it with something that wasn't in fact there. This is almost always a face, right? So take um, a scene of two people or however many people doing something and graft on a different person's face to the people who, were, who uh, you know, are actually in the scene. So you could imagine a situation where uh, it's a presidential candidate uh, doing and saying things that they, in fact, did not do and say. Um, the technology that creates these things is based on a methodology called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And these are especially powerful because one of the key ways in which they're built, they're, they're like two subsystems that are trained to do battle with each other. One is called the generator. And its job is to invent new random images. Now, it's actually pretty easy to write a computer program to make a random image. You just roll dice and color the dots based on what the outcome was. But you'll get an image that looks like static uh, almost all the time. Um, but just to say, algorithms can generate images. And a lot of the techniques are how do we generate more and more realistic ones. <coughs> on the side from that, we have the discriminator, who is the constant competitor of the generator. Its job is to tell the difference between real and fake. And then they kind of feed each other in this loop 
of computational power where the generator gets better at uh, making fake images and the discriminator gets better at detecting them. But ultimately what always happens is the outcome of this is you develop a generator that can almost always fool the discriminator, which is to say that it's a losing battle. Mm -hmm. um, and I can be pretty sure it's a losing battle. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute, but to your comment about detecting them, there are a lot of techniques for detecting deep fakes. Uh, I interviewed someone a couple months ago, maybe a year ago at this point uh, on my podcast, who came up with a technique that uh, studied eye movement. So they noticed in a lot of these deep fakes, oh, yeah. the fakes never blinked. So he said, well, we, you know, and some people never blink. You know, I meet some really kind of awkward people every once in a while who, yeah, do this for a long time, but eventually everyone blinks. And you can study that statistically and stuff like that. So he came up with a technique based on the eye blinks to detect a deep fake. And I think it was within two weeks that the fakers had improved their algorithm and now they blink. Um, for a while, they were looking at highly sensitive changes, things that our eyes can't tell. But like, you know, here, if you zoomed in and on a piece of my skin, it's sort of pinkish or whatever, uh, you know, mostly red hues, some green and some blue. If the numbers the, in the computer is just a number, right? It's some percentage red, green, and blue. Those numbers can fluctuate ever so slightly and our eyes don't see it. Um, and they do sort of naturally, like our blood flowing through our bodies does in a very, very subtle way change our outward appearance. Um, and if you were to amplify that, we kind of glow with our pulse. Uh, the human eye can't detect it. And I think it actually takes pretty sophisticated equipment to detect that. But some of the deep fake techniques were relying on that kind of stuff for a while because the fakes didn't have pulses until people built that in as well. Um, and at the end of the day, look, we're on camera right now. What if I pulled out a weapon and went outside and attacked somebody? Uh, I could do that. That's a physical thing. Not, nothing prevents me from doing that. That could happen and it would be a real video. Um, therefore, it could exist on a hard drive somewhere. It's just bits in a sequence that store that video. So eventually the algorithms will get good enough that they will put the bits onto the disk in an order where we will not be able to tell the difference. Um, it's the only mathematical outcome. When will that happen? We don't know. Uh, and we're not there yet, thankfully. Pretty much all the deep fakes I see, I can tell. And I think a modestly trained eye can tell. But it will be within my lifetime that seeing is no longer believing. It's pretty, it's pretty scary and it's pretty exciting. I mean, I think about, ooh, there was a shadow again. Ooh, scary. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting chills at the back of my neck whenever I see this thing. There it goes again. Ooh, it is. <laughs> the, um, you, you can't tell if it's coming from inside or outside. It's really interesting. Um, the, things that, the things we'll be able to do with deepfake are some, some amazing things. Like maybe you could have people who, were, who sang with, um, you know, who, have passed, who are dead now. They could come back and look like they're singing with somebody else. I mean, I, I know they've done that, but to have yeah. it happen again, you know, to be able to see um, them just more realistic and, and other things, there's some historical things I would love to see reenacted, you know, maybe Lincoln's get doing the Gettysburg uh, address to have him with his voice and uh, Ingersoll, I'd love to hear him. Um, there's so many people we don't really have recording recordings of, or maybe we have the recording, but it would be neat to be able to see it. It'd feel like maybe we were there. So, I mean, I kind of like the idea of having these realistic looking fake things, but of course there, there's a lot of abuse that could be happening too. Sure. Um, you know, there's, we could take a moment and just hypothesize some of the neat ways. I describe mostly like image and video. Deep fakes works on audio too. So imagine a independent musician who says, uh, I play one instrument, but I want an orchestra to accompany me and I can't afford it. Um, to have human realistic uh, instruments play and sound like they should belong with that guitarist or whatever he's playing. Um, awesome, right? To be able to let uh, a, a, get, get a musician get access to that sort of thing that they wouldn't have without achieving a certain amount of fame and, and that sort of thing. There's a lot of positive uses for it. Um, but it's coming up on us very quick, and its most scary uses are around the dissemination of misinformation. We've seen a little bit of that already. I can't say that I believe a deep fake has influenced any election, but that day will come. Uh, we are definitely going to see a lot of deep fake stuff as the lead up to the next U.S. election, uh, presidential election. Will it convince anyone is the open question that I'm only slightly concerned about in this run. But by 2024, you think that it'll have improved so much that we're really in problem having. Oh, without a doubt, yes. Um, it's getting that good. 
that's really that's really interesting. I was talking to Paul Offit, uh, Dr. Paul Offit, on Monday, and one of the things he and I were talking about was the importance that we need to have. Well, we need to vote, make informed informed votes. That's one of the things that, as a society, we can be doing to really improve um, uh, the situation we're in right now. But one of the things we really need to do is elect uh, scientifically literate people in, in, in yes. all areas. I mean, school boards to supervisors to mayors of town to everything, not just the president of the United States, because we need to be able to try to make the best educated society as possible. People who put a high emphasis on, on education um, and science and um, literacy. And if we can have a better educated uh, population, then they will be more able to understand. I think when you see, like you said, by 2024, deep fakes, you know, being able to really say, well, that doesn't seem right. Or I understand the science on this and I get it now. And, and, and maybe, maybe they won't have as much influence. I'm hoping. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, uh, regardless, your point, I think is well taken that we need to see more scientifically minded people and this is, doesn't talk about party lines at all, Democrat, Republican, anything. That is a must for our society. We need people who are evidence-based and scientifically minded in office, or at least deferring to those that are. You know, I, I wouldn't expect a politician to understand climate change fully. I've looked into it a bit. It's not my field, and I don't feel qualified to weigh in on it. But I do feel qualified to comment on the scientific majority that all agrees and say those guys are probably right because they're using the method. Right, you could probably do a little enough research to be able to figure out. I'm, I'm, I'm basing my opinion on the consensus of these other people who are experts, and you know we would have a better because I'm definitely not a scientist either, but I know enough to know that that looks kind of weird and that gives me red flags. Sure. And let's see what the experts say on this. Let's talk to people who were actually know, uh, uh, understand it, and we'd be able to give me some good feedback on it. Yeah, I think that's great when it comes to policy. You know, uh, someone says, hey, we should or shouldn't build this highway. I have no idea. Get the environmental people to weigh in, get the civil engineers to weigh in, and let's look at all the evidence. But with these deep fakes, all it takes is one video to go viral, sending a false message that could, could influence the public. We've seen things like that already through social media manipulation. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as strongly as it's made out to be, or maybe I'm uh, underestimating it. Uh, but the deep fake stuff's going to be a lot more threatening. Um, I believe that eventually we'll have to come up with some system where things are somehow watermarked or tagged or verified or whatever. Um, this is one of the rare places blockchain might actually be useful, uh, mm -hmm. but there'll have to be something where new, you know, official videos, news videos have a fingerprint type thing where we can instantly verify fake or not because um, the ability to detect it based on the content alone is going to go away. Right. I, I agree. I was thinking the same thing. I don't like the idea of legislating things so much. I, I would appreciate, I would, I would be happier just to have people be literate enough to go, oh, that's not real. Of course he didn't say that, you know, but if they had, yeah, like you said, something in the corner of the video, some kind of, some kind of symbol that would say this has been approved by the such and such, not approved, but it has been found to be not manipulated in this way, because obviously all video is yeah. manipulated, you know, we're, <laughs> right. yeah, we're enhancing the color or it something. If nothing else. Yeah, there's got to be some oversight, I think, that we would have some standard that we can trust that this has not been, the words have not been altered that we are hearing from a politician right now or Yeah, uh, my hope is that happens at a technology level, not at some you know, nonprofit review stuff. It needs to be a chip built into the camera that does some process that can be mathematically verified. And we can say the algorithm, you know, in order to beat it would require some astronomical amount of computational power. And we have some verification that doesn't require people to trust an organization or say CNN verifies better than somebody else, but something that's uh, just like uh, SSL encryption on your browser. It's not a political issue. <laughs> you use it and you trust it because if you look it up, you'll find RSA is a good approach. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to seeing this change. I like change. I really love new technology. I'm, I'm the type that is just like, oh, check it out. We've got a new update to our iPhones. I'm one of those rare people who's kind of like into that 
but <laughs> Richard Saunders is also really into that. He, he texts me and says, there's going to be an update on our iPhones tomorrow. And he says, I cleared out my whole day to be able to update it and then play with all the little things on it. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Dude, okay, you're, you're a little more interested in this than I am, but that's fine. <laughs> he was showing me, he edits the whole Skeptic Zone right on his uh, tablet. It was pretty impressive. He, yeah, it's amazing how he does it. He's been at my house a couple times and he takes, he's, he'll sit on the couch and he's got his little tablet and he's got all this little, um, um, you know, the audio things and he, he puts things in, takes them out, moves it. I'm just amazed that you could do that on your, on your tablet. I mean, he does a lot of it on his phone. He uses an app. He just sure. adjusts it. Technology is making life better for us. We have more time for cat videos. And true. <laughs> we can I'm fake hoping. those too. There's just not been a lot of interest in it yet. Oh man. They're wild <laughs> enough by themselves. You don't have to fake, fake anything with a cat. <laughs> well, we could make them fluffier or jump higher. Or... Oh no, they're cute. You can't, I just, <laughs> no, little goats and, and, and skunks. I've seen some cute things. It's, it's been great. <laughs> I, I love all that stuff. But so I want to talk to you about, so you got involved. You're not one of my GSOW editors, but a long time ago, uh, Jay Diamond, one of a friend of ours, from the Bay Area skeptics, he said, so you got this Wikipedia project, it's really interesting and great, but how can you measure your success? How can you know if you're making an impact? And so, you know, that buzzed around in the back of my mind a lot, because of course I have to, um, I have to know if we're making, I mean, are we just writing Wikipedia pages that are sitting there vacantly, nobody's reading them. And we, we know that, um, that some people have been able to figure out how to pull the data of views page views to any time a Wikipedia page has been accessed, we can see how many times it's been accessed. Of course, we don't know if they're unique users. We don't know how much time they've spent on the Wikipedia page. They could be clicking on and clicking off. They could be reading it all in full. We, we're not really sure, but the only data we're able to collect is page views. So you enter the picture and you said, I could do that. And you wrote up this, this, project this software for me and we went back and forth on it for years testing it and figuring it out and uh, a couple other people got involved jeff um oh i hate saying people's last names i know i wanted to mess up jeff from our wikipedia group he uh he got in and he kind of fine-tuned it and awesome. created something called stat badger i that's what i named it stat badger i don't know Mark, I think, Mark Edward, I think, came up with the name, and I said, that sounds good, Stat Badger. And so what we're we able to do is now we can, troll, we can track all of the Wikipedia pages that we have had significant input in, not just a page we've edited, but something is significantly it and uh, rewritten or created, not a stub, but a full page, and we can, we can look at it. And we hit um, some enormous amount of views. I should look really quick while I'm, while I'm thinking about it, because... I well have into the it. millions, as I recall. Yeah, well, I think we're about to hit another num big number, and let's see if it's loaded because it takes about a day. It only updates pretty much once a day, and when right. it does, it, it's like phew, all these numbers come in here. So I don't know if they've updated um, to that. So we've written a little over fourteen hundred Wikipedia pages. I think it's fourteen hundred and sixty, and um, of course, because I'm doing the Zoom call right now, it's a little slow. Uh, sure. Working. But I will have the number for you in a second. It is, oh, here, here comes a bird. Hey, this oh, is Yoshi. There's the bird. Hello there. Hi, I Yoshi. don't know how to speak to a bird. Polly, you want a cracker? Yeah, see how he blends into the background? <laughs> Hello. And you don't have a little friend for him? No, um, we might one day. We've tossed around the idea about getting another bird, but uh, for now, it's just Yoshi. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful, Yoshi. Hi, how are you? And how old do they get? They'll, she may outlive me. They can live in their 40s and beyond. Is that right? Yeah, she's 10 now. And she tilts her little head. That's so adorable. See, cat feed. Everybody's all of a sudden clamoring over here to watch the feed because we brought, we brought Yoshi in. Oh, sure. <laughs> Cute animal will do it. Yeah, so you put her up on that curtain behind she's you and she is gone. Though. She would be yeah, gone. Yeah, she'll just disappear over here. Oh, yeah. I don't see her at all. That is really weird. Bigfoot comes out and goes like that. Look at that. Well, I don't want a missing birdie. I'll keep her up front. Oh, that's good. So um, it loaded now. So Stat Badger has just loaded those Wikipedia pages that we've been tracking, 1,400 or so. 
and we're at 64,946,458 page views. That's fabulous. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> I just so don't you know, get it. And you guys have a strategy, right? Uh, it's not just any old page. I mean, I'm sure you, in, you know, update a lot of like prominent skeptics and whatnot, but there's um, an educational component to it too, right? Well, yeah, we're hoping to educate, but we don't, I don't tell people what pages to, to edit. So sometimes a lot of the work we're doing, these, a lot of these 1400 page views are very tiny views. They're people who've already passed, who've already died, who maybe get a hundred page <laughs> views a month, something like that. So I tell people, edit what you want, um, edit what you enjoy, um, something that you find interesting, you think is needed. I don't have a, a list of these need to be done because they gotcha. uh, are to be highly viewed, but we have caught on a few trends. Um, like we found that anything that's science related that is going to be on Netflix is going to give us huh. a massive amount of views. And uh, Rob Palmer wrote a Wikipedia page for uh, a Netflix. He was watching a Netflix show. Um, I'm trying to pull it up right now. Of course, it's being really slow. It was, uh, her name was Deborah Feldman, I think is her name. and she was writing um uh, they did a documentary on her about her acidic my acidic roots i think it's about a woman who leaves the, a community in brooklyn and oh, she goes to germany it was a really great little show i uh, i think it was like six episodes uh, we watched it right after easter but rob watched it and said this is fabulous so he rewrote the wikipedia page for the woman because it was a stub and that's already generated like 2 million views since April. And then um, he said, I'm gonna turn around and write the Wikipedia page for the book that the documentary is uh, based on. And because it falls in the science, scientific skepticism world, that's part of GSOW because it's about religion. And, and so we wrote that and that's, I think had like 500,000 views, something like that. So sometimes we do pick up on something that has, um, that's in the media. But uh, we, we don't always know. Uh, we had sure. one Wikipedia page written by somebody in Denver for a man who's a UFO. Um, he believes that he's been abducted by aliens. Well, he says he thinks he's been abducted, abducted, abducted by aliens. And he uh, was trying to get Denver to build a landing strip for the aliens to be able to land. So that's how he got his notoriety. Oh, he should, they should share the one that Unarius already has in El Cajon. They've got a landing strip for UFOs. Eh? Well, he wanted a special one. So he went okay. on this for the Denver people. And so when they come to Denver. So we wrote the Wikipedia page for him, totally forgot about it. I think it probably got like 500 views a, a year. You know, it was nothing. And then there was a documentary made about him for Netflix. And all of a sudden, this it just goes crazy. I mean, he's, he's got like a couple, I think he's got at least a million views on his Wikipedia page now because people go from Netflix to go, who is this guy? And they Google him, they get the Wikipedia page. And next thing you know, they're on the Wikipedia page. It's really a fascinating um, little cycle. So we tell, I tell my team, write whatever you want. Maybe someday it will hit, but you know, and people start going to it. But even if they don't, a Wikipedia page is going to be important to somebody somewhere. Yes. Even even if it's the descendants of the person who they're writing the Wikipedia page will go, oh, Grandpa has a Wikipedia page. Wow, he's he's way more interesting than I thought. <laughs> I don't know. It's just just get it all done and get it into the languages we possibly can. So I, I you know, I guess it would be probably beneficial if we really kind of focused on pages that we thought were going to be hitting next but it takes all the fun out of it i want my team to enjoy themselves well sure yeah i guess i mean as long as it's you're going to get more mileage out of the team when they're writing about things they're passionate about and i guess to me the part that always struck me is almost purely educational is that it, it seems that someone who's into skeptical topics is more than likely to update scientifically and um especially around topics where maybe that's a bit needed you could probably go put some things under the tardigrade page that need to be there, but uh, mostly for scientists. Whereas if it's about firewalking and uh, that people should be aware of the risks or, or, you know, these sensational people with big claims and you need to know that there's a second point of view on what they're saying. Um, Wikipedia is a good, seems to have a good process for filtering out bad information and accepting good. So having those links there are what lead people who might be researching Wu into uh, the skeptical fold, I think. Mm -hmm.
uh, Leonard Jamel says it's called Unorthodox, if you guys want to check it out. Unorthodox. Sounds Unorthodox. interesting. It's, it's really, it really was well done. And, and I think it's only maybe five or six shows. I, Mark Edward and I really watch very little TV or, or anything that has to do with like a big screen sitting down and staring at it for a long period of time. But we did watch that and that was, we got all done and we loved it. And Mark is saying, speak for yourself. I can hear him in the corner <laughs> of my, <laughs> I can hear him channeling him in the other room. The, um, the uh, one thing that I know that kind of fits this category, what we're talking about is educating, um, is we've been really trying to focus on anything that has to do with vaccines. Um, sure. Anything, people of vaccines, anti-vax groups, pro-vaccine groups. Um, the Wikipedia pages for the science of vaccine are already really well written. So we don't really mess with that too much. And I don't have a lot of scientists on the team. So we just try to stay with things like biographies and, um, translating good pages in, from one language to another so people have information. But uh, Paul Offit, uh, we were talking about that and he said that, that, that that's really important that we do that because it's probably going to save lives. People are going to get some good information about vaccines. Yeah. I think that we're going to, the world we're seeing right now where we are getting pushback for vaccines right now, I think it's going to be like a tsunami when we get closer to getting that vaccine because people are just I mean, we can't even get people to wear masks. So yeah. I mean, can you imagine vaccinations? And and Offit said, we're probably going to have to have two vaccinations. Like you'll have one and then you'll have to go get a, a, a booster. So, sure. Um, yeah, we've got uh, the skeptic. I mean, as a society, we do, but the skeptical community is closely tied to this. We, I am afraid we've got a bigger fight than we ever knew coming uh, in front of us with the vaccines. I, I hope I'm wrong, right? I hope... People have a system shock related to this and everyone's like, no, you, you don't want to die or spread this. Go get the vaccine. Enough of this nonsense. But uh, I don't know, maybe the uh, impact of Andrew Wakefield is going to be more damaging than anybody could have anticipated. Right. It's, I'm, I'm an optimist. So I think that we have, we have a few months um, to get, we've been, like I said, we've been working on vaccines for, for several years. So we've already yeah. have a good, um, We've already been doing it, so keeping it done, keeping them updated, and rarely we see any vandalism on them. People are shocked to hear that, but we really have almost no pushback from the um, anti-vax world. They just don't edit Wikipedia. They don't seem to think that that's important. They'd rather start another mommy group or start, a, you know, and push it through Facebook or something like that. Yeah. So we're we're you know Wikipedia you really can't get away with it as much as you would think. Right. Yeah. I don't know. So PsyCon's going to be canceled this year. I'm really disappointed. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, you've been one that goes to a lot of conferences. I do my best. I don't make it out to everything. Um, I'm yet to make it out to uh, Nexus, uh, which is on my list. But yeah, I try and get around. There's so many great conferences. It's going to be online this year. Right. So I'll be there for the first time. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, something that will resemble Nexus, I think. Sure. So. But um it's, it is sad not to be able to see people in person. We're doing sure. our best with Zoom, but um, I have barely ventured out of our zip code, Mark Edward and I, since Pi Day, March 14th. We had mm -hmm. people come over from the skeptic group and we sat and we social distanced in the living room. And that just seems like such an innocent time looking back on March 14th, thinking, oh, this will be over in a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, this is just. I'll see you guys in a month, you know, we'll, we'll go, we'll be able to meet back in person really soon. And now I just can't believe this, this, this world has changed so much. Yeah. Um, I don't yet know where we are on the vaccine front, but I've heard Fauci say a few uh, optimistic things and I don't know, I, the, I can't support this, but it seems to me there must be a real Manhattan project effort going on here. Um, and there have been occasions like that in the past where we put people on the moon or split the atom or whatever it is that I think if human ingenuity pulls together, uh, we can definitely defeat this thing, but it's not going to be tomorrow or the next day for sure. Absolutely. It's, and I think that, like I say, if we can get people all on the same page, I mean, we see people around the world that have, who've done this. I mean, Yes, Australia, North Korea has done some, or North, sorry, South, South Korea. Not South, North Korea. South, I don't know much about North Korea, actually, but South Korea has done some amazing things. It, it can be done. I mean, th there are places all over in Europe and, and others that have taken it seriously and closed down, open back up, things are okay. I mean, Richard yeah. Saunders keeps talking about how he's got people coming over for a barbecue. I'm like, what? 
how can you have people over for a barbecue? That just doesn't make any sense. But he's like, well, it's just not shut down like that over here. It's just, you know, we can do that. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> darn Australians, you know. Sure. I don't know. It's pretty well, sad. It's, it's cause and effect. I uh, watch my local Los Angeles numbers on a regular basis. And we are now at the, you know, uh, we're not in a good spot. The, the wave is really starting now. Uh, we've had some big spikes recently and um, I don't know all the dynamics, but I know what a curve looks like and we're at the unfortunate <laughs> part of it. Um, unlike places like New York that are past it now, seemingly. So for the moment, what's, what's new for, uh, I would think that you would be having a blast with all the data. Well, um, interesting you bring that up. I look at it a little bit, but there was a bit of controversy, appropriately so, in the data science world, criticizing people who were trying to do things with it when they shouldn't have. Um, so there was, a, there was like a do-gooder effort at the early stages of this of like, hey, all this data is becoming available, which is true. There's a lot of good tracking and, and stuff has been put together. But that doesn't mean that anybody who knows a little bit of math and regression stuff should go in and start making predictions. There's, these are complicated dynamic systems that involve human behavior and immunological models like the SIR model that um, I had to go and learn and I'm certainly not an expert in yet. So it's sometimes a little bit of information can be a bit dangerous. I would never be one who would censor data or say don't do an analysis or that, this or that, but I think people like me who aren't in the medical field need to be very careful with uh, how they share findings from that data because it's great to go apply techniques. Let's do a REMA analysis or whatever and see where it's going, but show it to a doctor, not Facebook, and you know, see if they find it useful. You have some ethics there. That's good. We need yeah, that. <laughs> I, yes, I, I suppose it's ethics. To me, it's more common sense. Um, oh. Information should be there to inform. And if your information is, you know, uh, it's one thing if you're like, hey, I, I ran some norm numbers. Would you review what I did and give me some feedback on my math? Wonderful. Let's do it. But hey, I proved that this is all going to be over in three weeks. Not a great message. Right. It's a, it's a lot more complicated. There's too many yes. variables, as we say, as they say in mathematics. There's just way too many. We, we can't, um, we don't know what the other hand is doing either. We have no idea. I mean, China is inoculating their, um, some of their army, I believe, right now, even though they're not even in third, the, the third trials bit. I guess they're in third trials by just inoculating a whole bunch of people. We don't right. know happen with that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, and, and then also, whenever the vaccine's ready, or supposedly, we have to, we have to test it in people of all different uh, uh, sizes and ages and pregnant people and people who, yeah. have, who are going through chemotherapy and people who have different ethnicities. And there's so much, you know, we have to know how it's going to affect everybody not just this one right. standard uh white male age 40 you know whatever yeah that is. How is that's exactly talker? where yeah, i don't know that's exactly where people who have skill sets similar to mine should be applying themselves uh, the statistics around how we measure efficacy are very well established um you know on another angle, we could need to test it against every great age group and every little uh, slice and dice you want. It'll take longer to get the vaccine. So we need to use statistical techniques to test a sufficient but minimal number of people to arrive at the conclusions. It needs to be stratified across all the important groups, maybe even oversampled for high risk people or, or whatever. But um, yeah, there's a lot of prior pre-existing knowledge that can be applied to help accelerate those processes for sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to open this up and make it see if there's any questions that people might have that you can start asking. It takes about a 15 seconds for them to start seeing what I say to go to the Facebook page. Um, what, what, what do you want to uh, make sure that we get through? Uh, what's new for you? What are you doing besides uh, hanging out there big bear with your wife and your bird for another day or so? What, what's new with you? Well, uh, you know, I'm working pretty hard trying to keep things going as the company changes and evolves. So that occupies a lot of my day, but I still do Data Skeptic. We're a weekly podcast talking about machine learning and AI and stuff like that. And get to spend a lot more time with our birds since we're still sheltered in place, even though a lot of restrictions have been lifted. We found a way to do everything remotely so far. Yeah. Or not totally remotely. I'm obviously yeah. in the cabin, but you know what I mean. We uh, we keep our distance best we can. We're doing the best we darn can to get to get uh, 
to use to do the best we can like i said i've been doing trivia and everybody watching you guys are invited thursday nights at 6 30 open wait the, does mick open come because i don't know if i can win if mick no shows. mick has not been showing up mick All west right. is not i'm really shocked but i'm writing the questions so they're totally not what you would expect i think i guess i mean it's 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 really interesting writing, researching and writing questions because I'm not an expert in, in a lot of um, field. So I'm using, I, you know, it's, try, it's hard trying to get it to the right level of, sure. you know, oh, this is so easy. Of course, they're going to know this right away. <laughs> and then other times you're like, they go, Susan, you worded that so weird. I have no idea what you're talking about there. And then I'm like, okay, well, I got to explain it. But so far, people seem to really enjoy it. We started out with 19 people. And now we're, last night, we hit 30-something people. And it keeps growing. So I guess they're really enjoying it. It's about three hours long because, you know, of course, we, everybody talks with each other. And we're on Teams. Deborah wanted to make sure we're on Teams. So, so um, you know, everybody has different expertise. I think last night, we had to choose... I figured out, I had a list of the top 10 Beatles singles. Oh, so what what that. singles were on the, what, what Beatles songs were on the U.S. Um, oh, U.S. specifically, longest. okay. Yeah, so people were going through and they had to go through and they had to figure out top 10 that were on the list. And then the week before I had, I had chosen, I guess there's a museum in, there's a National Toy Museum so when cool. they inaugurated their toy museum, they chose 18 toys that would be in their museum. That was it for the whole year. And so I told them, pick 10. And the conversations they had trying, trying to find, I mean, they were like all over the place with these toys. And it was not an, how do I say it? It doesn't mean that you know, it's not like a Jeopardy or something where you need to know the, you know, the name of the left-handed curling player that won the sure. such curling Olympics in 1968 nothing like that and uh leonard said it has been a lot of fun so he's 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 enjoying it deborah likes it and oh and one so year one time how do we get Claudia. signed up do you have to try out for the team or how does one no, get involved no. uh, come on to uh facebook i have in fact i just put up next week's uh facebook uh trivia all you got to do is you should probably you know say you're interested in joining so that you get a reminder and then we show up at 6 30 I post a link to the Zoom, just like we're doing right now, and people just start coming in. And then I hit the, I figure out, okay, we want about five people per team. I hit the breakout box and we forgot how many teams it was. Last night there were seven. And then I just randomly hit it and everybody randomly goes onto a team. So you're in a team with different people each time. Oh, neat. And I try to create questions that are kind of okay for Canada or for uh, America or for uh, Australia, because that's, UK is already asleep by the time. I mean, it's like early in the morning mm, for them. Sure. So the people who play are in Canada, uh, United States, or uh, Australia. I suppose New Zealand could join too. And um, Carl with a K said, plus a thousand. I don't know what he's talking about. Plus a thousand. <laughs> plus a thousand. Hey, everybody, plus a thousand. It must mean something somewhere about 15 seconds ago. Uh, oh, GMT plus uh, 10, maybe? Yeah, anyway. possibly. Oh, okay. Um, he, oh, okay. So yeah, Paula says that we usually have people from Canada and Australia. We need more Europeans, but the time time difference is a problem. But anyway, so what we do is we put people randomly on teams, and it turns into more of a social affair because you've got these five strangers to each other. And yeah, they're five strangers, but sometimes there's like a family on the other end. So you'll have like three or four people who are, mm -hmm. who are in the household together, quarantining together. And um, oh, Carl, so Leonard said trivia's been a lot of fun. Thanks again. And Carl said yes, plus a thousand because he likes ah. a thousand more. Okay, so we were, we were like that. I'm like, is he talking about the time zone? And we, <laughs> a thousand people are showing up, but we think we can handle it. We can handle fifty people, maybe a thousand. But anyway, we'd love to have both of you guys and and the bird. Oh, for sure. It sounds like great fun. And I don't see any more questions out there. Everybody seems to be just chatting amongst themselves and saying, you know, uh, uh, adding to the conversation you and I are having with the little little bits and things. Random does us make us strangers. Oh, he says, sometimes there are people on the same team. This is an interesting about skeptics, Kyle. 
and tell me if you don't agree, is that you just can't get away with saying something to a group of skeptics. <laughs> we have to overanalyze it. And, and it's like, if you're even factually off a little bit, especially these engineers, oh, they just, they'll just push it. And they're like, that's not exactly correct. <laughs> you're like, yeah. can you just get away with saying it's sort of, it's, it's this generality. Like Rob is saying, so. <laughs> yeah. So Rob Palmer saying, well, sometimes when you hit random, you don't always get a stranger. Sometimes you are on the same team as somebody you've been on before. <laughs> You should, by de that's what one would expect, given true randomness. Yeah. Do you yeah. know about uh, randomness and what Apple did? So something that's truly random, like when you listen to music on shuffle, uh, from time to time, it would be the case that the same song would play twice in a row. But people find that to offend their senses of randomness. So Apple made their system mathematically less random in order to oh. not have certain repeat pro uh, processes like that. So That's interesting. on purpose, you'll never hear the same song twice in a row. And, and you know, if you shuffle it, um, it's designed that way. So it's technically less random as a result. Okay. Or uh, uh, intuitively random or pleasingly random or something like that. Yeah. Okay. That's different. I remember talking to um, Lauren, Lauren Pinkris, who's uh, uh, one of the founders of the modern skeptic movement along with Paul Kurtz and James Randi and Ray Hyman. And so he had, he had um, back in the day, he worked at the VA clinics and they had malingerers because of course, if you were able to prove that you had some kind of illness or um, traumatic, some, you know, whatever, now we know it as PTSD, I guess, mm -hmm. but if you had some, some, some of these things then you would get financial benefits from being, so there's a, a a huge reason to want to be um, have some ailment like deafness or f caused from whatever service you had in the military. So I remember they put together some kind of test for malingerers. It was really fascinating because human beings aren't really good at getting real good randomness. So mm -hmm. like if you ever had somebody with the with headphones on and um, they were trying to fake that they couldn't hear certain things, certain sounds or, or so what, um, they would, you could tell when they were trying to malingeringly um, fake it. And they had, they used statistics to be able to tell whenever somebody was, um, uh, what it should be, I guess, as I'm trying to say. Sure. I, I'm not sure I'm explaining that as well, but I'm trying to say that, well, it's, that there are the, that there are algorithms out there that should explain how random something should be kind of often coming up like you're throwing a dice how often should uh, the same number come up five times in a row i guess they kind of have some sort of formula for that yeah i mean you can uh you can figure it out pen and paper actually yourself if you're curious uh, just do the combinatorics but there's shorthand formula where you can say you know if i roll this sided dice this times how often will i see this and uh you can find out quickly the answer and i think that's one of the interesting things about stats is though even though you can calculate the answer pretty quickly you always kind of have to. Our intuitions really let us down with that kind of stuff. It's very hard for somebody to just randomly choose a bunch of numbers and so on. I, I think I think yeah. math is really fascinating. A book I would read again that I enjoyed was um, The Lady Tasting Tea, which is about, I guess it's the beginning of, of statistics and how we look at statistics. And I don't know if you read it. It's kind of written for a person like myself that's the history of statistics. The Lady Tasting Tea. And what it's about is I, a man was, was with his friends and one of the women in the group said, I guess we're having tea. And she said, I can tell the difference between when you put the milk in the tea, put the milk in the cup, pour the water in versus when you pour the water in and then put the milk in. She said she could taste the difference. And he said, well, you know, there's a way of testing that. And he, he worked out this way of thinking about statistics. And I believe he's the father of statistics. And that might be on the next uh, um, trivia. So you guys should be. But it's, it's an interesting book about the history of the field of statistics. I think that's what I'm trying to say. The Lady Tasting Tea. See, I can recommend a book too. You know? oh, sure, that sounds really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's only been tw 20 years ago. <laughs> Anything you would recommend highly, Kyle? 
Um, I just started this. Uh, I don't have an opinion about it yet, but algorithms of oppression, uh, which I guess is probably backwards for you guys. No, no, it's, 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 it's fine for us. Okay. How search engines reinforce racism. So I don't yet know if I agree with the thesis, but it's something of concern that's very modern. So I'm looking into that a little bit. Oh. Um, some of the basic ideas are just about, well, the cover tells the story, if you can read it. Um, this person's experience typing in, uh, why are black women so... And then the system auto suggesting. Oh, I think I've heard of this. What's the name of the author? Uh, it's by oh boy, I'm not going to give it a okay. Nobel, yeah. Nobel. Okay, yeah. Not only is it uh, uncommon words, but it's backwards for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. I just uh, uh, updated a Wikipedia page with a book that is out. I wish I had hand this handy at the moment, but um, a woman writing about oh. Carol Tavis had reviewed the book in Skeptical Inquirer, and it's about um, how racism from, or sexism, it was sexism, you know, about like, um, oh, the, the author's point was like in Sweden, snowplows come in and they plow the streets, and so the people can get to work, and so that's the first place they go is to the streets, but what she was saying is that if they looked at statistically who is most likely to have an accident, um, or what needs to be probably plowed first, she says, is the sidewalks, because more women are out trying to get to the bus or trying to get from place A to place B, and they're more likely to fall or have some kind of problem when they're out with their children in strollers or whatever. And she was saying that, that once they realized that statistically the uh, accidents were more in the walking than in the driving of the cars, they started plowing the streets um, second, you know, they did, they took I care of the person. sidewalks first and then went to the streets. And she said that it made a difference in the, the, um, amount of accidents in Sweden at that time. And I'm just saying Sweden because I just, it was a random Scandinavian country. It could have been somewhere else. Don't fact check me on that. <laughs> but I thought that that was, you know, there's some really great books out right now that are looking at things in a different way, challenging, challenging how we, um, how we do view things. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating time to be alive, to be honest. Yeah. With you. And what a wonderful result that all they had to do is switch the schedule. It d didn't cost them anything. Didn't have a big R and D project. Nobody got hurt. Just switch it and accidents go down. Yeah. Uh, and she had a lot of examples like bathrooms. How long does a, you know, women, if you're at a, if you're going to a, a, an event at a stadium, how many women actually attend? How much time does it take in a bathroom for a woman compared to a man? You know, um, all kinds of really interesting ideas like that. And I think that, I think that we have, um, it's a really great time to be reading and, and exploring these things. Yeah. The data is available and it's very powerful. So these people are just giving me just more and more comments, but they're not like asking questions. So I, unless there's anything out there. Well, I've got really one for that. you to wind up then. Okay. Uh, especially knowing that you look at Stat Badger more often than I do. Have okay. you noticed any changes in trends of what paranormal type things people are interested in these days? Uh, is anything on the uptick? That's a great question. So what we have noticed is that, um, what's on the uptick? Things like spontaneous human combustion and have have and you anything UFO related, those are all still all right on. You know, they've not changed. They've not fluctuated in in uh, time. They're just steady with all the um, the views have been pretty steady throughout time. The we have had um, one of the uh, one of my editors wrote the rewrote the Wikipedia page for the 1976 swine flu outbreak. I learned a ton when we when we wrote that, and it was back in the time where they thought there was going to be this huge swine flu up, uh, problem, and so they went and they made this vaccine, and they were trying to rush it to get it out, and they didn't know if they should mass inoculate the United States or not, because they weren't 100% sure that the vaccine was going to work, and there's all sorts of repercussions of not having a perfect vaccine and also forcing it on a population that might not work because it, it, it ruins the credibility of the vaccine, obviously, because sure. people go, you inoculated this, there was these side effects, and now, you know. So, so that Wikipedia page was receiving almost no page views, and then because of the pandemic, now it's receiving a lot. So people are, seem to be interested in things that are 
related to the history of vaccinations. That's um, good. One that we really saw that had a huge um, influence, and I, I'm going to take credit for this because I'm talking now, so I can, but <laughs> there was a, this has been a year or more, there was something called the Blue Well Game. And this right. is a conspiracy that, it was a conspiracy, it was a hoax. And it was spread all over in children's schools. And people thought that children were committing suicide. And so they were sending notes home with the parents saying, um, look for, I mean, notes to the parents, look for your child drawing a fish on anything because they may be participating in the blue well game, which took 50 days for them. To, and the end result was they would kill themselves at the end. But what they were doing is children were killing themselves and children do kill themselves very sadly, but not because they're taking a challenge, but because of reasons that they would kill themselves, you know, bullying, uh, medical problems and so on. Um, and Nothing so, new or surprising, same old. It, yeah, but but yeah. what was happening is the schools and parents were able to blame this game, this hoax, yeah. because well maybe then they wouldn't have to take responsibility for the signs that they actually did. Yeah, yeah. Blame it on this. So this. So anyway, this we got millions of page views for the blue well game. So when our editors wrote it in English, Russian, Portuguese, Spanish, and it just flew off the charts. People were watching, were looking at it. But what ended up happening is it eventually subsided. We came out with the Wikipedia page updated, and we eventually were able to, um, uh, um, you know, I think as the Wikipedia page was really well written, it started to to page off, you know, just like a normal trend would. But what, what happened was one of our editors in Montreal, uh, Robin Canton, he started seeing this thing called a Momo challenge, and I think Kim Kardashian had tweeted about it. And we saw the stats go. So we immediately wrote the Wikipedia page for Momo Challenge in English, Portuguese, French, and some other languages. And we saw the stats go just like, you know, just stratospheric, just like with the with the, the Blue Well game. But what we also saw is boom, they crashed almost immediately. Oh, I woke up Yoshi. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start you. <laughs> but what we saw is that they they just crashed completely unlike the blue well game which was more of a bell curve like this you know with a gradual kind of bell but but the momo challenge went up and then right back down with a very tight bell curve and we think that that is because we came out with the wikipedia page so quickly that when people were looking for information on it and we had the page really tightly written with the, the lead at the very beginning saying this is a hoax you know even if they don't read the rest of the page, they got, oh, it's a hoax. Right. Oh, okay. Yep. So I think that's what happened. And so we take full credit for that. But that received a ton, a ton of views. Uh, Blue Well Challenge has already seen over 6 million page views. It finally came up. Momo Challenge hit 5 million page views so far since we created it. So um, I'm seeing uh, Natalia, uh, you know, I hate these names. <sighs> Plus, She's a good friend of the skeptic community over there in Brazil. We wrote her Wikipedia page very recently, and uh, she's been on being interviewed almost every day about hydroxychlorine. Oh, know. yeah. So we wrote her Wikipedia page in English and in Portuguese because she's in the media like crazy. We just wrote it really recently, April 15th, and now I'm looking at it, and she's, she's getting a ton of views. The Portuguese page we wrote for her just in the last week has seen 16,000 page views. So um, wow. as she's in the media, Great. people are Googling her name to be able to see who is this person, what are her yeah. credentials, and why is, she, why is she talking to me on TV or whatever. And, and so now they're able to find her and they're able to go, oh, she has real credentials and here she has this and she has that. Um, um, so trend-wise, we rewrote the demonic possession page recently. That's getting a lot of views. Haunted house, we rewrote. People are, it's all over. Conspiracy mm -hmm. theories are fa fascinating. Um, it, I think people are using Wikipedia more often now because we're home. A lot of us are home. Some of us are home. That would make sense, yeah. We're, we're, we're able to do a lot more um, uh, research and things. I just looked at one of the Wikipedia pages that was written um, in Portuguese, it's getting a ton of page views. It is, oh, is it Spanish? It's, oh, it's Spanish. It's, let me translate it real quick. It's got a ton of views. Antibiotic component. It's, um, 
non-living chemical and physical parts of the environment that affect living organisms and the functioning of ecosystems. We wrote that recently, and that's getting a ton of page views also. Uh, we wrote the Wikipedia page for coronavirus, for coronavirus, not for COVID-19, mm -hmm. but like the top, um, the main page for like, that it category explains, of yeah, yeah coronavirus is sars mars um and uh, the common cold is is also a coronavirus and then covid19 and we put like pictures on there and one of the goals in our in our group is the wikipedia page needs to be written for the average person to read with a high school education without yeah. a scientific background somebody just like susan <laughs> so if i can read it and understand it we're good <laughs> And so that's where we where we are. But there hasn't been a trend. It's just all over the page, all over the place. And it's that's why our team is great because we're able to um, yeah. uh, react and <laughs> everybody has grounds, their own expertise. Yeah. And um, we've written about, um, when I, I remember Derek uh, Henneke was writing about, he writes about stains, you know, the medical stains. He writes about drugs. Oh, he writes about, uh, and we get a lot of views on those. He wrote about, there was a new Ebola drug that just recently came out. So he wrote the Wikipedia page for that new Ebola drug. Hopefully that it will give, you know, some um, some up for them. Um, just, oh, it's, it's really interesting. I feel like, um, I feel like I've learned so much. Oh, the Hungarian Wikipedia page for 5G. We we rewrote that. Oh, and that just got a ton 5G of five G conspiracies. Yeah, and he was just writing it about the five G, and I think he's got a little area on there that has for um, you know conspiracy part, acupuncture, oh, activated charcoal cleanse. We just wrote one recently on uh, cow cow dung. I think it was cow dung, because they're believe it or not, that's actually some places are using it as a COVID. I think they're using it as a Ooh, okay. So we wrote that. Oh, just amazing. The things that we have. It's just it's the only medicine I want from cow dung is homeopathic. <laughs> that sounds great. But yeah, no, there hasn't been anything that's telling me that this is on the rise. But um, but we really have been trying to focus more on the vaccine world because we think that that's going to be really yeah. powerful to us to have. Let me just look real quick and see if anybody else has had any brilliant questions that they're asking now that i've been looking at the stats because they just get so interesting okay go. sounds good all right so anything else kyle i'm all set no, i really appreciate you inviting me uh, i think this is great uh, i love uh, syncing up and i hope i'll see you at the next trivia thing oh it's been so much fun it's great to catching up with you guys um and it's great for you to show off your little birdie there who's just oh yeah a good time she's a star watch. she's on instagram you can find her and She's got <laughs> probably more follows than me. Oh, that's funny. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you giving me a lot of your time because, you know, you're on vacation. Over. So, all right. So I'm going to post this over to YouTube. Anybody who's watching, thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon, I hope.